Hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Pankaj Dingra, a proud fan trammer and your faculty for strategic business reporting exam. Welcome guys, welcome to a brand new session. We will be kickstarting our strategic business reporting today, my friend, with the conceptual framework. If you really, really have to do well in the strategic business reporting exam and of course in your IFRS as a career, in your financial reporting as a career, you really have to have a very strong foundation and that's what this conceptual framework will be providing you. It will give you the foundation in terms of you know what the IFRSs are and of course how the IFRSs are made and what kind of conceptual framework is being used in terms of making those IFRSs for you to be best prepared in terms of handling any kind of nuance that you may get to see in the exam. While we may see this as a theoretical chapter, but examiner in the strategic business reporting exam tests this, this, this topic in a very different way and we'll touch upon as we go further in terms of how examiner has been testing us. But it is important for us, my friend, to not to really lose our heart in terms of thinking this to be theory and of course leaving this, which many of the students do in terms of, you know, really going through and of course skipping this as a theoretical, theoretical you know, topic. We are Fintrammer, sir. We are not supposed to and we will not lose and leave any, any, any mark and any topic that we really have to be prepared for. Absolutely. I'm not going to, going to let you do that. So what we're trying to do today is, of course, building the foundation of the conceptual framework. But one thing that I really want to be categorically clear to all of you is that many of you at times feel that since you have come from the background and you, have, and you have not given say financial reporting as an exam, you may tend to feel that you know, you may have to refer anything or do anything more than these classes. Absolutely, absolutely not. You don't have to do anything. What we have done is that we have crafted our session in a way that all of those concepts are being well taken care of that you really need in case you have not done your skill or the knowledge level sessions of the financial reporting because you, have, because you were exempted from it. We have ensured that they are being well covered in this and well covered in a way that you are able to grasp it and of course hit it in the best possible way. So should we start off with a journey today? Yes sir. Should we kick start with the conceptual framework? Yes sir. Let's start with the conceptual and regulatory framework. Now if you really have to have a very strong, strong foundation for yourself in relation to any kind of financial reporting that you would do, you would need to understand the overall framework under which the entire financial reporting works, under which or from which the entire IFRS are being taken out or being made out of. And that is what we will be doing in this session. That is what we'll be covering in this session in detail. Let's move on. Now, what is this conceptual framework? Let's read out. Conceptual framework for financial reporting is a statement of generally accepted theoretical principles. They're basically the principles which form the frame or the framework, if I may say that, for reference of the financial reporting. It is the framework in which the entire financial reporting gamut will work from, will operate from. Got it. Its theoretical principles provide the basis for, for what? The development of accounting standards. So it helps in terms of developing the accounting standards, which you, we all will be applying and of course, implementing in whatsoever we may do and then understanding and interpretation of the accounting standards. So if it, if it basically gives you the framework to make up the accounting standards and then to interpret them and of course to implement them. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Therefore, conceptual framework will form the basis of determining which events should be accounted for, how they should be measured and communicated to the user for financial statement, which is the basic, my friend, which you really need to know from the standpoint of really, really, really doing well in any kind of financial reporting exam, as well as what you may do when you hit your job and go in over there and start applying the financial reporting concepts. This seemingly is a theoretical chapter, you know, as I've been saying all over again, but this, uh, all of these concepts becomes very relevant from the examination standpoint because they may not be tested directly, indirectly examiner really wants you to understand all of this. Alrighty. Moving on, let's touch upon some of the advantages that conceptual framework has and it is like but obvious things but let's circle that down. Advantages of conceptual framework, it helps in what? Financial statement being more consistent with each other. Got it sir. 
has a proactive approach in determining the best policy since it gives you the framework and it helps you in terms of you know what you really need it really helps you in terms of making the decision around the best policy got it less open for criticism if it gives you the overall framework there is a very vague chance that you will go haywire and you'll go out of that framework hence it really reduces reduces the criticism that one may have it has the principle based approach now principle based approach is something that i really want to cover in detail in a while but for now let's circle down and understand this only that it really helps us in the principle based approach got it some standards may concentrate on effect on the statement of the financial position and others on the profit and loss we all understand that and we all would have done that in some way or the other many of the ifrss or accounting standard for that matter touches upon the pnl and some of them touches upon the balance sheet so it just that it's it's more of an obvious statement that you can find various accounting standard touching various other domains which is absolutely absolutely fine all right moving on disadvantages of the conceptual framework now what are the disadvantages okay this disadvantages of conceptual framework says single conceptual framework cannot suit all users when never i will give you any kind of framework my friend you will always say that i am being restricted i can't go beyond it's very obvious and that's what the biggest disadvantage of conceptual framework is and anything and everything else circle around this only need for variety of standards for different purposes again the same thing that you are being restricted and then preparing and implementing standards may still be difficult with the framework again the same thing my friend if you have the framework you may find difficult you may find restrictive in terms of you being being only categorized on to that framework in terms of doing and thinking anything and everything which is a disadvantage got it but what is the purpose of conceptual framework now my friend if if the uh, regulators have really bought in the conceptual framework to start with and then they started off making ifrss in between this conceptual framework there has to have some purpose of this conceptual framework now what is the, that the regulators are, ex are expecting out of this let's see that the purpose of conceptual framework is to assist assist in what the board they have to assist the board in what we'll we'll circle that down it will also assist the preparer of the financial statement all righty it will also assist all the parties when understanding and interpreting the ifrs standards so it, the purpose of the conceptual framework is that it is basically assisting assisting the board in what we will we'll just circle that down assisting the preparer of the financial statement and assisting anybody and everybody who are intending to understand and interpret any kind of standard now what is that that the board has to do with this it assist board in what in developing new ifrs standards helping to ensure that these are based on consistent concepts if i'll give you the framework and if i'll tell you that you have to start making accounting standard out of these concepts out of this framework it is bound to have the consistency my friend because anything and everything that you may do will be consistent and that's what the bigger bigger purpose of having the conceptual framework is that clear yes sir now preparer of the financial statement what is the assistance that this provide to the preparer of the financial statement it helps in when when no ifrs standard applies to a particular transaction or when ifrs standard offers a choice of an accounting policy many of the times my friend and i can tell you you being part of uh, various organization as finance team member and also as finance head many of the times we have got into the situation wherein we didn't had right and appropriate and straightforward cut to cut accounting standard that was being applicable over there i can i can tell you one example we acquired one company when i was part of the the one of the largest it sector company uh, we acquired one company and we when we acquired that company we had many leases in that company running out at that point in time since we had leases we also had the leasehold improvements being being part of that lease because they were being capitalized 
Alrighty, we'll get into the details. So don't really be, be be bogged down by this, but we'll get into the details when we'll touch upon the lease. But I'm just giving you a in nutshell in terms of you know how it really spans out. Now, the treatment of leasehold improvement over that lease period was not being cleared at that time by the accounting standard. Now, if you're really stuck by uh, by any kind of situation like this, then the first thing and the foremost thing that you do is that since accounting standard is not there, what are the frameworks being available in terms of recommendation over that kind of a transaction? And you refer back and then you start doing the way the framework is advising or suggesting. That's what this framework is all about. Not anything and everything gets covered by accounting standards or IFRS, my friend, because there are routine, on routine basis, there are many transactions happening, many new ways of businesses happening and coming up on board. Accounting standard follows the new business. They cannot be made in advance. And that is the reason there is always a stopgap time kind of a time frame or a or a time frame wherein we don't have the standard, but the business is operating. And how do we manage that? We manage that with the help of a conceptual framework. Because this helps you in terms of deciding what kind of transaction needs to be accounted for because it gives you the general principles. And that, that general principles hold true for any and every transaction. So you can apply those general principles, apply those framework onto that kind of a business scenario and take the right decision for that, mat for that point in time at that point in time. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on. The conceptual framework is not an accounting standard. We all understand that, sir. Got it. It does not override the requirement in a particular IFR standard. Now, I really want you to highlight this and underline this. What does this mean? Many of the times you would see that you have an IFRS, you have an accounting standard, but what accounting standard says may not be that you know may not be similar or same in comparison to what the conceptual framework is saying there can be conflicting conflicting arguments in between the two because accounting standard has been made considering that particular transaction in mind which may not have all the characteristics of the conceptual framework because it has to be that way considering that transaction in that case ifrs is the superior one you have to follow the IFRS. You don't have to follow the conceptual framework. Always, always remember my friend, whenever in conflict, IFRS takes the precedence. IFRS is the superior one. IFRS is to be followed. Conceptual frameworks comes later. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Do not forget that many of the time examiner asks this directly as well as indirectly. Do not forget that. Alrighty, let's moving on. Moving on the to the objective of the financial reporting. Let's read the objective of financial reporting. Conceptual framework states that the purpose of financial reporting is to provide information to the current and potential investors. I'll highlight that current and potential investors, lenders and other creditors that will enable them to make decision about providing economic resources to an entity. Now, not, this is not something that we have not seen and we have not heard and we have not like studied anywhere. We, we know this. But the basic, basic thing has to still get instilled in you, which is the objective of the financial reporting is to provide the current and the potential, potential people. Whether it can be an investor, it can be a lender, it can be creditor and so on and so forth to really enable them to take the right decision. Whenever you are being stuck in a scenario wherein you have to, you are thinking through in terms of, you know, what needs to get into the PNL, what needs to really get into the balance sheet, always think about that is this objective of financial reporting is being taken care or not. If it is not being taken care, considering that if you omit something, the, the objective of financial reporting will get defeated then remember my friend, you have to have to include that in the financial statement. We'll, we'll discuss that in more detail in terms of you know all of these aspects, but I'm just trying to lay down the foundation so that you're pretty, pretty clear in terms of how should you be thinking about as you go forward on the financial reporting as a journey. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on. If investor, lender and creator are going to make decisions, then they require information that will help them to assess, assess what? 
assess entities potential future cash flows if i am the creditor i am the investor i am always interested in in how this organization would be doing from the standpoint of cash flows from the standpoint of profitability and what not management stewardship is something i always look upon of the entity's economic resources how the economic resources of the organization is being taken care how the money is being spent how the assets are being safeguarded it is more to do with the management stewardship in terms of dealing with all of these areas sir we are very much clear sir there is nothing rocket science in this i know my friend but i am just just trying to build these concepts in you because as we go forward on to the various ifrss my friend these concepts will be playing in your mind in some way or the other is that clear yes sir moving on now how do we assess the entity's future cash flows you need to have the information about what to assess an entity's future cash flows user needs to have the information about about the assets which is economic resources of an entity about the liability and equity which is the economic claims against the entity and you need to have the understanding about the income and expenses my friend we all understand that which is nothing but the changes in the economic resources and claims in the simple language if you really have to have the understanding about the entity's cash flow you really need to understand the assets you need really need to understand the liability you really need to understand the income and the expenses which is very 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 basic and we all understand that is that clear yes sir moving on moving on to the qualitative characteristic of useful financial information now see my friend we are really 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 moving towards towards building up this framework in terms of thinking through what really matters for us what really matters to the examiner from the financial information standpoint now what is the qualitative characteristic i really want to give you some mnemonic over here but what is really important is that we do not miss on the concept concept that i really want to build on so we'll just jump on it and see as to how we take this forward all righty the conceptual framework states that financial information is only useful if it is relevant and if it is having the faithful representation of the entity's transaction okay we'll get into the details the relevance and the faithful representation are the fundamental characteristics of the useful financial information got it now let's understand what is this relevance and what is this faithful faithful representation let's understand that relevance relevant information will make an impact on the decision made by the user of the financial statement got it for an information to be relevant to you it has to have an impact for you to make a decision now let's say uh, let let me give an example we uh, we were contemplating a decision over an acquisition and in midst of that decision the quarter got close and again i'm talking about about the scenario wherein i was heading the finance of an it company and we were acquiring a company and when the acquisition decision was being finalized as an it was in the process of getting finalized we have to close the quarter because we were the listed company at that point in time now if that kind of a scenario is there and you have a potential acquisition just coming your way do you really need to inform inform people around it it was a big time discussion that happened that point in time that is this information relevant at this point in time because it will certainly certainly impact the mind of the investor and of course the creditors and so on and so forth you have to contemplate and of course take various considerations into your mind when when you're deciding something like this relevance is something you should never forget again you know there were few things that we did till that point in time which really had to be get had to be disclosed because we transferred the funds and so on and so forth that was being disclosed and since that got disclosed various other information also was to be disclosed or to or also got to disclose because that was required considering that relevant uh, relevant element was certainly there at that point in time we will touch upon you know on 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 these small small things in detail when we will will touch upon the respective ifrss as we go forward but what is important for now is that anything that you think is relevant from the standpoint of your investor or user or any kind of creditor to really be aware of you should certainly 
certainly disclose that. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on. Relevance requires management to consider materiality. Yes, if information is material, like what we did that point in time, that acquisition was material. The amount that we transferred was material. It has to be, has to be disclosed. But had it been a very small lease kind of a thing or very small um, acquisition of a property plant and equipment kind of a thing, which was like, let's say, just taking an example, I'm talking about the balance sheet of millions of dollars. That amount was like, you know, maybe $500. If you would have omitted $500 from there at that point in time, does that really would have mattered anyone? Absolutely not. Is that relevant? Nopes. That is what you really need to understand. It has to be relevant if it is a material item that really changes the mindset of your investor, of your creditor and the other users of the, users of the financial statement. I'm sorry. But if it is not material and it is really not impacting anyone, leave it there. Leave it there. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on. An item is material if omitting, misstating or obscuring would influence the economic decision of the user. And that's what we discussed. If there is anything and everything that can be uh, that if gets if, if gets omitted can be a, an a, an element of of omission can be an element wherein you have you are misstating the accounts. Do not do that. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So what we have done, we have done the relevance, my friend. Let's move on. Now we have the faithful representation. Alrighty, let's go through that. The faithful representation of a transaction would represent its economic substance rather than its legal form. Now, what does this mean? Let's say it through. A perfectly faithful representation would be, would be complete, would be neutral and would be free from error. Complete, neutral, free from error. Complete, neutral, free from error. Sir, you are repeating again and again. What's the reason, sir? reason is that I want this to have in your head. You should not forget this. Complete, neutral and free from error is something you should always have in your mind whenever the faithful representation gets into picture, my friend. Very small, small things, my friend, but examiner tends to play around with it and we are Fintrammer, sir. We are not, we will not let him do that and that's what I'm trying to make you for. Should we go ahead? Yes, we'll touch upon you know some of the elements over here in a while. Board notes that this is not fully achievable, but these qualities should be maximized. Now you cannot have 100% LFP financial statements. Board understand that, but what they say is that you should maximize it. As much as possible, you should have these elements, if not 110%. Is that clear? Yes, sir. When preparing the financial reports, preparer should exercise prudence. And prudence means what? Prudence means that assets and incomes are not overstated. Okay. And liabilities and expenses are not understated. There are many examples in your uh, uh, I would say in the world, my friend, wherein you would find many of the smart accountants playing around with people. We'll talk on Enron in a while when we'll touch upon the relevant, relevant IFRS. But again, Enron, the WorldComs of the world are the classical example wherein the prudence was something that was not being taken care. People really, really overstated their assets and understated their liabilities, leading or misleading the people in whatever way and effectively resulting into loss of millions and trillions of dollars of all of those people. We'll talk on that. We'll talk on that in detail, as I said, as we move forward. But what is important is as a prudent, as a prudent accountant, you should never forget that you are not supposed to overstate your assets. You are not supposed to understate your liability. You should definitely, definitely take that into consideration. And this is nothing but the neutrality. However, this does not mean that assets and income should be purposely understated or liabilities and expenses should be purposefully overstated. Such intentional misstatements are not neutral. Neutral means you have to ensure that there is a perfect neutrality in between you know, the decision that you're taking from the standpoint of really having the right assets being recognized onto your balance sheet and of course, right liabilities being recognized onto your balance sheet. Is that clear? 
Yes, sir. Moving on, my friend, we have some more characteristics. So we do, you know, from the qualitative characteristics, we have done what? We have done the relevance. We have done the faithful representation. Now I do have some other characteristics that I really want to stick on onto your head because examiner really test you on this. Okay. Now one is the additional, sorry. In addition to the two fundamental qualitative characteristics, there are four enhancing qualitative characteristics of the useful information. And that is what? That is comparability, timeliness, verifiability, and understandability. Comparability, timeliness, verifiability, and understandability. Let's read. Comparability. Investors should be able to compare an entity's financial information year on year and one entity's financial statement information with another. Your financial statement should be crafted and drafted in a way that this comparison thing never goes for a toss. Comparability is always always there my friend you should never never forget that got it timeliness it the name says it's all that it has to be very timely older information is yes useful we all know that pretty clear sir no problem coming on to verifiability now what is verifiability the knowledgeable user should be able to agree that a particular depiction of transaction offers a faithful representation now if i really have to give an example in relation to it now uh, you know, when, when we say knowledgeable user, it is more like that, you know, people from the same industry, same background, same knowledge, they should be able to construe the same results from the financial statement uh, 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 in order to be verifiable. So, for example, if I'm, uh, let's say I'm working for an IT company and IT company publishes the financial, the people who understand the IT domain, people who understand the financials of the IT domain, people who understand how, what, what, what really impacts what, the two people should be able to get to the same results from that financial statement in order to be verifiable. So it has to be clear and crisp and you know, whosoever 2, 3, 10, 15, 20, 100, whosoever number of people are, you know, they should be able to construe the same results. That's what verifiable really means. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Understandability, very basic information should be presented as clearly and concisely possible very basic my friend we all understand that important is that we do not miss on these these names when i say names the comparability timeliness verifiability and understandability these pointers are very 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 important and for that purpose only my friend i have a mnemonic to be shared with you because i have seen students forgetting this and losing marks on this we are in drummer, sir we are not going to lose any marks and that's what i'm here for my friend what we really need to do is we really need to have a mnemonic for these these qualitative characteristics so that it really sticks onto our head and we do not forget that now these qualitative characteristics really add what really add value to your cv my friend because if you know this then from your CV standpoint, you are good in terms of handling any kind of queries that you may have from the standpoint of handling that in your exam as well as in your interviews. That is the reason, my friend, I think this is a fruit for your CV. A fruit for your CV, I would say it is CV fruit. Wow. CV fruit, what does that mean, sir? C for comparability it should be comparable all right v for now you know it v for verifiable got it sir pretty clear f for sir f for we know that sir it is a faithful representation got it sir now coming to r r is relevant know that sir what is ui sir ui is that it should be an understandable information got it sir sir what is t we all know that t is timeliness this is something we have already covered, but I really want this CV fruit 
to stick on to your mind my friend because i can tell you many of the times examiner plays around with this directly or indirectly that you really know what the qualitative characteristics of the financial information is all about is that clear yes sir should we go ahead yes sir all righty moving on we have the cost constraint now remember my friend whatsoever we may do from the standpoint of really giving the right qualitative financial information cost consideration should never be forgotten which is what which is like the cost of really having that information should not really overtake the benefit of that so cost benefit analysis has to be taken care from the standpoint of ensuring that you are able to demonstrate right information at that point in time that's what it is all about the cost constraint is sorry cost constraint is what cost constraint says producing financial reports take time and and cost money when developing ifrs standard board assesses whether the benefit of reporting particular information outweigh the cost involved in providing for it and that's what you also think about when you are really making the right financial statements is that clear yes sir all right moving on let's touch upon the financial statement these are the very 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 basic things my friend but we'll quickly touch upon because we really have to brush up before we really jump on and deep dive into into ifrs as a whole all right financial statements the conceptual framework notes that the financial statement are particular type of financial report which is a very basic thing the purpose of financial statement is to provide provide what provide to the user about an entity's assets liabilities equities income expenses got it sir very basic this information is provided in statement of financial position we all understand that statement of financial performance which is nothing but the pnl account and other statements such as statement of cash flows and notes very basic things my friend but it 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 really boils down to the fact that we all have to know this to really perform well in your exam and of course really do well in your financial reporting as a practice so you should definitely have this at the back of your mind that what is that that you really need to do from the information making standpoint all right the element of the financial statement which is again as i said is the is the basic basic thing which we all you know even right now are aware of which is nothing but the having the economic resource which is nothing but the assets and what is asset asset is a present economic resource controlled by an entity as a result of a past event now i really want to give you an example over here sir do you really have to give an example of an asset yes why reason being that i really want to uh, circle down some of the nuances that you may get to see uh not only in exam but also you know as you as you move forward we all understand asset right we all understand the uh, you know the, our cars our 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 buildings and, and and so on so forth everything is being categorized as an asset the, the way the 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 uh, conceptual framework explains this is that a present economic resource controlled by entity as a result of a past event anything that you would have done in past which has led you to have something right now at this point in time is an asset if you paid money in past you have an asset right now you have a building right now you have a car right now i have a pen right now i have a computer right now is an asset so you from the definition standpoint it is nothing but anything that you have done in past which is really helping you have an economic resource at this point in time is nothing but an asset whenever you are thinking about an asset think this definition in your mind you will always get to conclude in the rightful manner is that clear yes sir moving on to economic claims we all understand that that is nothing but the liability liability is what the present obligation of entity to transfer an economic resource as a result of a past event it is of course the vice versa of what we read in the asset which is nothing but anything that you would have done in past which is really helping you or now really warranting you to pay something or do something as an economic resource for somebody else is that clear yes sir equity the residual interest in the net assets of the entity effectively whatsoever the owner have contributed is something that relates and 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 becomes the equity which is nothing but the net assets which is assets minus liability is nothing but the equity got it <clears throat> now if you really have to circle down on the income and expenses 
you know, which is nothing but the changes in the economic resources and claims of a result of financial performance. We all understand that it is it is while it is too much theoretical, my friend, but we all understand what the income and expense account really has. From the income standpoint, it is nothing but increase in the assets or decrease in the liabilities. Of course, if there is an income, it will certainly increase your asset or decrease your liability and that result in an increase to the equity because ultimately income will increase the equity. It has to increase the equity. All right. Expenses. Expenses is decrease in the in the asset or increase in liability that result in decrease to the equity. Now this on all of this exclude what excludes the contribution from equity holders excludes the distribution to equity holders. Very basic things my friend you the, the any income that you may have has to increase ultimately your equity. So it has to somewhere decrease your liability or increase your asset. And that's what the entire penal framework is all about. And of course, to the expenses, it is vice versa. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Other changes in the economic resources. Again, you know, something that that we, we, we really have to, you know, deep dive contribution from and distribution to the equity holders that happens. And of course, exchange of assets and liabilities that do not increase or decrease equity. If that is something that happens, then it is it is mainly the other changes. We will get into these details, you know, when we'll try and preparing the financial statement, we'll touch upon each and everything over here. Right now, we are just building the theoretical concepts, my friend. So do not get carried away. Do not get bogged down. We will be practicing a lot as we go further and practice the financial statement preparation in terms of, you know, what goes where we will be touching upon on all of these areas. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Economic resource is what is a right that has the potential to produce economic benefit, which again goes without saying. Moving on to the recognition, my friend. Now, what we have done, we have touched upon the we have touched upon the financial information in terms of, you know, what is financial information? What is the objective? And of course, you know, what are the good characteristics? We have done that. Then we did in terms of, you know, what kind of financial statements are there? And of course, the items that are there in financial statements is something that we have already covered. Now we are moving on to the recognition and the recognition of the items of the financial statements, which is like a logical sequence in terms of understanding the entire entire financial gambit. So let's jump on in terms of, you know, what the recognition and the recognition has to say. Coming on to the recognition. Items are only recognized in the financial statement if they meet the definition of one of the elements. However, not all items meeting these definitions are recognized. Elements are recognized if recognition provide users with the useful financial information. In other words, recognition must provide what? The relevant cost, relevant information, the faithful representation of the assets or liability and resulting income and expenses or equity movement. The cost of inclusion does not outweigh the benefit. Now, is this not something that we have already discussed? Yes, sir. Anything that gives you the relevant information, anything that gives you the faithful representation in terms of, you know, what has to be there in the form of an asset or liability, anything that really helps you in terms of recognizing the rightful income and expenses onto your PNL, anything that wherein the cost of inclusion does not outweigh the benefit, you have to have to recognize that. Is that clear? It's very basic, my friend. And as I said, you know, the way we do it, we, we understand things with the help of various examples. So it becomes a hell lot easier for us to really appreciate that. And that's what we will keep doing as we go forward and of course do other sessions. But what is important is that these theoretical, theoretical concepts really sticks on to your mind because anything and everything that will built on in the form of IFRSS, these basics are there. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right, moving on. Recognition might not provide the relevant information if there is uncertainty over the existence of element or if there is a low probability of an inflow outflow of the economic resources. So you have to think about, you know, what really has to go and get recognized. Coming on to the de-recognition. Now de-recognition is the removal of some or all of the assets or liability from the financial statement of, 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 of or statement of financial position. This normally occurs when entity loses the control over an asset or has no present obligation for the liability. 
accounting for D recognition should faithfully represent the changes in an entity's net asset as well as any assets or liability retained. So effectively, you are taking it out. So it has to get represented over there. However, D recognition would not be appropriate if exposure to variation in the in the elements economic elements economic benefit is retained. Of course, if you retain it, then you should not have it. You know, D recognition. Important over here, my friend is. That whatsoever we have written over here, the basic of this is that anything and everything that you need to do from the recognition standpoint or from the de recognition standpoint, you have to understand that it has to be a faithful representation like what we read over here and it has to be relevant. And of course, the cost of inclusion should not outlay the benefit. So effectively, you are keeping in mind that is it relevant for me to include? Recognize. Is it relevant for me to exclude? De recognize. Is the faithful representation is there for me to include? Recognize. If the faithful representation goes for a toss, de recognize. Always, always think this way. You will never get to a situation where you're, wherein you will not be able to answer this. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on. Now that we have done the recognition and de recognition, the important piece is how do we? measure it in terms of you know what amount we should recognizing for what is that that we really need to have it over there let's do the measurement when recognized in the financial statements okay elements must be quantified in the monetary terms okay conceptual framework outlines two broad measurement basis there are two broad measurement basis for any and every transaction to get recognized one is historical historical cost now what is historical cost <clears throat> historical cost is the cost at which you purchased that particular asset or the cost that was there at the date of transaction my father purchased a building 20 years back for XYZ rupees or XYZ dollars that amount whatsoever you know the number of years we have passed by stays the historical cost that XYZ dollar is the historical cost of that building we will of course uh, decrease and of course adjust it for various depreciation and the other things but historical cost remains to be that XYZ dollars isn't that very basic? Yes, sir. Historical cost of an asset is the cost that was incurred when the asset was acquired or created and for the liability is the value of the consideration received when the liability was incurred. Very basic, very clear, sir. No issues. Historical cost, pretty clear. Moving on, the current value. The current value? Now, what is the current value? Current value reflects the measurement date. Okay, it reflects the date on which you are measuring. Let's understand that. First thing first is the fair value. Now we have a respective IFRS that we want to touch upon and I will be covering it today itself because that is very relevant when we are discussing this. So we will be touching upon fair value uh, IFRS today itself. But what is important right now is that we should understand that one of the measurement of the current value is the fair value. Now, what is the fair value? Fair value is the exit price, price at which asset would be sold or liability would be settled, which is IFRS 13. We'll touch upon that in a while. But what is important over here is that we understand what is this all about. Many of the times, my friend, we have an asset which needs to be recognized and we do not have like the all other information being available else than the the fact that you have to take the fair value because many of the IFRSs as you move forward will say that you have to recognize an asset at the fair value or you have to bring the asset at the fair value. So you really need to understand what the fair value over here really means which is not, nothing but the exit price which is like what would you get at this point in time if you really exit from this asset or really sell this asset to, friend, to anyone. Classical example, I bought the shares, shares of let's say uh, Delta Corp. The Delta Corp share that I, when, I, when I really bought was like $100 uh, at the date of purchase. But at this point in time, 
considering the market nuance, considering the stock market and etc. etc., that uh, share value has fallen to five dollars. Now, if I have to really talk on the fair value of these asset, fair value of this asset is the exit value, which is like what we will, what I will get if I really exit from this share at this point in time, is the fair value. Now, what is that? That is five dollars. If I will exit right now at this point in time from the share of Delta Corp, I would be getting five dollar per share, and hence five dollar per share is the fair value of this share because that is the exit price. We will be touching upon this IFRS in a while in detail, but what is important right now is that when we are understanding the measurement base, we understand that one is historical cost and then is the current value. And one of the current value is the fair value, which is nothing but the exit price, which is what we discussed is the exit price of Delta Corp, which is in this case is the $5. Just for you to don't forget, I am mentioning over here as an example, what we discussed, which is Delta Corp $5 current market price. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Coming on to value in use. Now, value in use, what does this mean? You know, all of these terms seemingly when we read it becomes, you know, comes, comes across as a very difficult concept, but it is just not that difficult the way we really, you know, expect that to be. Many of the times you do not have any, uh, any basis in which you can really have the uh, value of an asset being recognized. But there are ways of doing that. Like what we, what, what we just saw, the fair value is one way of doing it. Value in use this is another way of doing it, wherein many of the time you, your, the computation of your asset in terms of the value is dependent on the cash flows that asset is, is generating out for you. Let, now let's take an example. There is a source of revenue, which there is, a, there is an asset which has a source of revenue uh, of say $1,000 per year. That is something that I'll get over a period of five years from that asset. Now the regulator says that you have to calculate value and use of that asset by computing the present value of the future cash flows that you'll generate. Now I'll be generating $1,000 in year one, I'll be generating $1,000 in year two, I'll be generating $1,000 in year three, and $1,000 in year four, and $1,000 in year five. So effectively I'll be generating $5,000 over a period of five years from this asset. Value in use of this asset is nothing but this $5,000 being discounted, being discounted at the discounting rate of the cost of capital that you have, which is like, let's say your cost of capital is 8%. So you're, you'll basically calculate the annuity factor of 8% for five years and multiply it by 5,000 to really have the value of the asset being installed. You would have done that in some shape or format in various other forums. And of course, various, various other exams that you'll give. We will be calculating that in detail as we move forward. But this is more of a theoretical thing that I really want to build on into your head. So if you really have to have the value in use for an asset that is generating $1,000 per year for five years, then the value in use would be $1,000 into five, which is $5,000 into annuity factor of let's say 8% for multiplied with $5,000 would give you the value in use of this asset. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Is that difficult? So we will do examples and then we'll let you know. I understand that. Don't worry. But what I'm trying to do over here is that, you know, I'm trying to give you some practical concept of the theory also, so that when we'll do the practical concept, you'll be able to understand that. While, you know, this is just a theory, I could have read it, but I just want to give you some examples over here so that it really sticks onto your mind. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on. Moving on is the current cost, my friend, current cost 
okay sir we were doing measurement basis sir so the first thing that we did was sir the first thing that we did was historical cost sir clear sir so then we touched upon the current value sir the first thing that we did over there was fair value sir clear sir share sir delta cop sir pretty clear sir second thing that we did sir we did value in use sir pretty clear sir present value of the cash flows that we will generate for over a period of time pretty clear sir no issues third thing is the current cost sir so this is something that you need to explain sir all right which is nothing but the entry price fair value was the exit price my friend current cost is the entry price or or the replacement cost of an asset in the equivalent condition example the specialized machine now let's say let's take an example i use a machine which is a very specialized machine to give you the classes to give you the sessions to teach you now this specialized machine if i really go and sell outside it really doesn't have any value for whatever reason because nobody really you know uses that okay if that is the case then how will you recognize this asset i will recognize considering that if i have to buy an asset right now to do the same level of sessions the way i am doing right now what is the cost i'll be spending so effectively it is the entry price in terms of replacing this asset with the asset for having the same benefit what is the amount that i'll be paying let's say if i'll be paying i'm just assuming and, and giving an example let's say i'll be paying 100000 for really having the same set of uh, equipments what is there right now with me in terms of giving you the sessions then the cost of current asset would be 100000 it is nothing but the entry price or the replacement cost of an asset in the equivalent condition example is of course pankaj dingra's studio in terms of we really having the studio replaced by an external external source what is the amount that we would pay that is nothing but the current cost is that clear yes sir is that difficult no sir should we go ahead yes sir all right moving on selecting the measurement base the information provided to user by the measurement base must be useful we all understand that in other words it must be relevant okay and offer a faithful representation of the transaction that have occurred when selecting the measurement bases conceptual framework states the relevance is maximized if the following are considered number 1 the characteristics of an asset or liability the ways in which assets or liability contribute to the future cash flows very basic my friend this applies to the board when developing or revising an ifrs standard it also applies to the preparer of the financial statement when applying an ifrs standard that permits the choice of measurement basis very 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 theoretical but very basic we all understand that it is very 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 genuine and very much very much generic to anything and everything that we will do is that clear yes sir moving on effective presentation and disclosure again very basic thing in terms of how you would be effectively presenting and disclosing your financial statement effective presentation and disclosure is a balance between allowing entities to flexibly report relevant information about their financial performance and position and requiring information that enables comparison to be drawn on year on year basis with the other entities board believes entity specific information is more useful than standardized description so always prefer the entity specific information rather than giving the generic generic uh, uh, i would say statements duplication makes financial information less understandable avoid duplication as much as possible coming on to classification now what is classification classification of an asset into separate components may provide relevant information if the components have different characteristics you have to classify whenever it is required i have to classify the assets or liability whenever it is required i can't really have them club together you can't do that offsetting classifies dissimilar items together and is therefore generally not appropriate we all understand these basic things my friend but it is always good to have a refresher have a somewhat 
um, reinforcement of the same thoughts so that we do not forget in terms of you know how will we be preparing the financial statement when we hit the board all right coming on to the aggregation now aggregation refers to what refers to adding together of items that have shared characteristics if you really have the shared characteristics you can aggregate that like what we do with the data just take an example aggregation is useful because it summarizes information that would be otherwise too detailed however there is too much aggregation obscures the relevant information you can't have everything being aggregated and being shown as an asset or a liability you have to have the rightful you know description and rightful bifurcation or classification of assets and liabilities to really showcase the right information to the user criticism of the financial reporting now we do have the criticism right we do have criticism from the standpoint of you know what financial reporting really brings on to the table for various users number one it is a historical information on this is classic many of the uh, users or many of the there are there is one school of thought that that certainly says that the biggest biggest drawback of the financial statement is that it is it is past looking for financial statement is for the past year financial statement is not forward looking hence it is not helpful that is one of the criticism i'm not saying that is right or wrong but that is one of the criticism that people have that user have that it is past or the backward looking kind of an information it is not forward looking which they always need from the standpoint of investing and of course going with the organization and really staying with the organization for the longer period all right coming on unrecognized assets and liabilities at times becomes a concern clutter of information at times you do feel that there is too much of an information financial and non financial information clarity is at times a problem you can have financial information on to your financial reporting but non financial information how it is being taken care is something not clear estimates again many people doubts in terms of how are we estimating and we will be touching upon on various elements like what we have discussing over here in the various ifrs that we will do because ifrs really clarify some of these areas in terms of you know what should be the right course of action in relation to it coming on to the professional judgment people doubt professional judgment also in terms of you know they criticize that you know the professional judgment that is being applied may not be the right one that one should have which may or may not be correct but important is that this is one piece of criticism so if you i have to answer the criticism you know that you know these are the criti critical areas wherein people are thinking about criticizing the financial statement in terms of you know what financial reporting really brings on the table use of historical cost is again something very 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 questionable and many people do that that usage of historical cost is not the right way of doing it it is what it is and you know you have to follow the ifrs whenever it says so but important is that it is being criticized on it and of course policy choices in terms of you know what policy choices are being made um, you many of the times you think wdv you think straight line uh, what really fits in into that kind of situation some people may have a different school of thought in terms of you know that being a wdv and some people may have a different school of thought that being a straight line and so on and so forth depending on what policy we are talking about important is that this is something which is being categorized as the criticism of the financial reporting wherein people feel that these are the areas which are being not not being dealt or which are not being duly taken care in the financial reporting and which are the drawbacks of the financial reporting is that clear yes sir should we move on to the regulatory reporting yes sir all righty moving on to the regulatory framework now before we really move on to the regulatory framework there is certainly a need to discuss as to what this regulatory framework is all about we have for now discussed and have understood the basic conceptual framework what is there behind the financial reporting but what is also relevant for us to understand is that how have these standards and these conceptual framework is being made and of course who have made them what all are the regulatory bodies behind it and that is the reason we are now circling down on the regulatory framework in terms of you know what kind of regulatory framework revolves around it and who is responsible for what many of the times my friends examiner really wants you to know and understand these regulatory bodies and of course what all are their roles and responsibilities so it is imperative for us to really understand of course know in terms of you know what all these bodies or accounting bodies do so as to really have a strong hold of what 
their areas of responsibilities are so that if examiner directly or indirectly tests you on it you are there and you are able to handle that in the best possible way so should we start off what the regulatory framework is all about yes sir all right regulatory framework exists to ensure accounting standards are prepared to meet the need of users goes without saying sir the international accounting standard board iasb we will be touching upon few of the accounting bodies you should always have that at the back of your mind because i've seen an examiner really testing you on these accounting bodies in terms of you being aware of it or not depending upon you know what examiner has to test you there but he really wants you to know these accounting bodies and of course know the responsibilities of these bodies as i just said okay iasb is an independent accounting standard setter got it established in april 2001 it is based in london uk its predecessor is indian accounting standard committee iasc iasc was founded in 1973 which got replaced by iasb got it it reports to ifrs foundation do not forget that my friend ifrs foundation is something that is there which takes care of anything and everything which is an overall supervisory body for the ifrs and is responsible for promoting and facilitating the adoption of the ifrs do not forget that iasb has an ifrs foundation and ifrs foundation takes care is the overall supervisory body which is responsible for promoting and facilitating the adoption of the ifrs got it what is the standard setting process now if ifrs is being made which we will be covering in detail as we go forward but it is also imperative for us to understand how these standards are being made okay what is the standard setting process the procedure of development of an ifrs standard is as follows what is the procedure the board identifies a subject and appoints an advisory committee to advise on the issues that is the first step got it board may issue discussion paper to encourage comment so firstly they have identified the subject and appoints an advisory committee then they issue the discussion paper to encourage comment and of course gather the inputs okay then they publishes the exposure draft now when they have taken up the discussion paper and of course taken the inputs they come up with the exposure draft being the draft version of the intended standard they come up with the exposure draft that this is what the standard would look like can you guys really comment following the consideration of the comment received on the draft the board publishes the final text of the ifrs standard okay the publication of ifrs standard exposure draft or ifric interpretation requires the vote of at least 15 board members 8 of 15 board members out of 15 8 has to vote in order to in order to really really have it over there very crisp and clear process my friend and i really want this to get stick on to you so that you don't really miss on it because many of the times examiner directly indirectly as i've been saying again and again can't repeat more you get tested directly or indirectly on that so always tend to at least have a hang off in terms of you know what that is is that clear yes sir moving on this is something i have categorically bought in over here to ensure that you understand in terms of you know how these organization really works and you know of course how many organizations are there we know that we have the iasb which is nothing but this the international uh, accounting standard board which we have known now that you know it is there and then we have the ifrsic which is international financial reporting standard interpretation committee okay and then we have the ifrs advisory council and we did had one more body which is that sir we have one more body which is ifrs foundation remember i just explain you in a, in like in a while from now which was ifrs foundation over here yes who ifrs standard you know ifrs foundation is is which organization 
who IASP reports on to. Okay. And what is these three bodies doing? Let's understand that. What is the responsibility of IFRS Council? Advisory Council. Let's read that. What they do is that they provide advice to ISB on what? On technical agenda of and work prioritization. Okay. So they basically deal with or advises on issues of application and implementation. They advise is that if they get to see any kind of issues on the application and implementation, they really come up to the rescue. Okay. And then they advise on the benefits and the and the cost of proposal if there is any, because there are many times there are cost benefit as a, you know, as you have read by now that board themselves understand that cost benefit analysis is super important for any kind of financial reporting thing that you may do. They also assesses the same. What is the responsibility of ISB? They develop and publish IFRS. Okay. They lies with national standard setting bodies to promote convergence of the international and, and national accounting standards. So they are the ones who are really developing and publishing it. Of course, in IFRS foundation is something that they really need to report onto in terms of whatsoever they may do. Okay. Then we have the IFRS, IFRI, SIC, which is the International Financial Reporting Standard Interpretation Committee, which assists IASB to establish and improve standards, which issues interpretation, which provide timely guidance on the emerging accounting issues, not addressed in full standard. So as far as interpretation is concerned, they really help them to interpret that in the best possible manner so that there is nothing haywire assist in international and national convergence process. I really wanted to have these three accounting bodies of here because these are the ones which examiner you know, really wants you to know and of course understand what these organizations really do. Of course, it gives you also a flavor in terms of you know how the IFRSs are being made, who all are the accounting bodies that are involved in it, who all are the accounting bodies in terms of the responsibility elements that is being attached to them and what are they exactly doing. Understand this, understand this, uh, uh, these, this table per se, but you will understand in terms of, you know, what the overall process looks like and what is being done by whom. At times examiner expects you and directly indirectly tests you on, on some of these areas. We are fin trammers, sir. We're going to be rocking over there. Yes, my friend, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build on, that we do not miss on, miss on these small, small things. Because at times, if they test you on this, this figure, if it really sticks onto your mind, it becomes very easy for you. Should we go in? Yes, sir. Moving on. The criticism of ISB, you know, some of the criticisms that are there, I just want to touch upon the advantages and disadvantages before we really jump on and start the start the IFRS, IFRS thing. But I really want to touch upon this because you have should have that at the back of your mind. And I am not uh, of the opinion that we should leave anything that is there in the syllabus, uh, you know, which which you really need to be preparing for. The criticism of IFRS accounting standards and choice, it is sometimes argued that the company should be given choice in the matters of the financial reporting, which if IISB is doing, people feel that they are being restricted. They have to follow what is being given. They do not have a choice which ideally they should not have, but you know, that's what uh, people have been criticizing that for. But that's fine. Uh, having said that, you know, IASB, ISB, uh, if they have issued something, they have issued something and that has to be followed by everyone and anyone. What all are the advantages? They can reduce, even eliminate confusing variation in the methods to use to prepare accounts. We all know that. They provide focal point of debate and discussions about accounting practice. Very basic. They oblige companies to disclose accounting policies used in the preparation of accounts, which is very, very, very much required. They are less rigid alternative to force conformity by means of legislation. Of course, they, you know, since it is being done in a way that it provides flexibility to, to the users to, to understand that. And of course, flexibility to the users to implement that. It certainly, certainly is less rigid thing as compared to any, anything else. They have obliged companies to disclose more accounting information than they would otherwise have done if accounting standards did not exist. Alrighty. Now, what all are the disadvantages? Okay. 
many companies are reluctant to disclose information that is not required by national legislation with some arguing against standardization and in favor of choice one method of preparing accounts might be might be inappropriate in some circumstances as i said one size fit all never happens so it can happen that you know you may get into the situation wherein your uh, your one method is not suiting the other other area which is being suitable for some area but not may not be suitable for the other area but that's fine but that is the disadvantage all right standard may be subject to lobbying or government pressure in the case of national standards which is in fact the case many of the times it is being said that what is being crafted and drafted is again basis the the, the government pressure or the lobbying of of a particular industry and so on and so forth which may or may not be the fact but that is something that is considered to be one of the biggest disadvantage of the ISP many national standards are not based on a conceptual framework of accounting although this is basis of for IFRS standard which i feel is the right way of doing it while it comes across as a disadvantage but i feel that's the right way of doing it conceptual framework cannot get blindly and wholly accepted to all of the situations IFRS are there to deal with those particular situation which may have some kind of conflicting conflicting areas with the with the uh, conceptual framework but i personally feel that that that's what is important that's what is needed at that point in time and of course there may be a trend towards rigidity uh, you know you always feel like that if 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 you'll give you the framework that you have to work in that framework come what may you would certainly feel the rigidity which is considered to be one of the disadvantage all right i just want to touch upon the principle based uh, versus rule based approach now i the reason i want to touch upon on that is because this is something that you should you should have that as a foundation because many of the ifrss that we you, you would do will touch upon the approach that is being followed so it is it is all the more good to to understand what this approach is all about ifrs standards are written using the principle based approach this means that they are written based on the definition of the elements of the financial statement recognition and management principles sorry measurement principles as set out in the conceptual framework for the financial reporting we have understood that it is pretty clear sir no issues on that in ifrs the underlying accounting treatment are these principles which are designed to cover wide variety of scenarios without the need of very detailed scenario by scenario guidance as far as possible other gap for example us gap are rule based which means the accounting standards contain rules that apply to specific scenarios now this is something you should never forget and i have done uh, so uh, being a qualified cpa and of course you know the other things that i've i've hand i've seen and handled i can tell you uh, the the gap the us gap is very rigid in terms of that they being rule based even in fact servants oxley is the, is the classical example which is nothing but a rule based legislative uh, regulation that has really been thrown out on the people that this is how they need to do and this is what it is and period but ifrss are being made may, may being made on the principles or on the uh, they are based on the principles which is like they are being made uh, considering what is being needed at that point in time and they are based on the elements of the financial statement recognition and the measurement principles which are nothing but the conceptual framework they are more i would say flexible in terms of they absorbing various other things they are not that rigid as the us gap or the serbens oxley is because it is what it is over here it, if you are following it differently if you are following it basis the conceptual framework or if you are following it basis the ifrs or you are deviating it you know and and you are able to prove it otherwise that you know this there is a logical reason of doing it it is accepted too and so on and so forth so the flexibility that is being built up in the principle based environment is that they they keep evolving they keep changing in terms of you know what the need of an organization is what the need of industry is however rule based is very rule based kind of a thing which is very rigid in terms of you following it and you not following it IFRSs are more of the principle based areas or more of the principle based approach is being followed over there is that clear yes sir some of the advantages and disadvantages of the principle based approach 
principle based approach is based on single conceptual framework ensure standards are consistent with each other we have touched upon that rules can be broken and loopholes found principle offers a catch all scenario which is like you know if if they feel a gap as i said you know they they keep evolving themselves if they see a gap in terms of what they really need to do they cover up they change it and so on and so forth principle reduces the need of excessive details in the standards because most of the things are very much presumed or being being clarified in the conceptual framework itself disadvantages principle can become out of date as practices example the current move towards greater use of fair value change principle can be overly flexible and subject to manipulation now it is it is very much there you know if you are not being very rigid and not being rule oriented the interpretation can be different and at times that can lead to manipulation too so that is something that one can call it to be a disadvantage is that clear yes sir now this my friend finishes the conceptual and the regulatory framework this is the foundation that i really wanted you to know before we really jump on and start doing any kind of ifrss because this is the the foundation what you really need to know in terms of you know how the ifrs is being made what is the conceptual framework what all are the things in the conceptual framework what all are the objectives of the conceptual framework what is that financial reporting that really has to do what are the objectives of financial reporting what is the qualitative characteristics of the financial reporting and so on and so forth the more you know it the better you are equipped in terms of now dealing with the various ifrs because now you know the background that you know where the ifrs are coming from who all are the accounting bodies being involved in the ifrss who does what and so on and so forth that's the foundation we really want to build on before we jump on to the next level which is now we will be starting off with the one small ifrss which i really want to pick up today because that was more relevant from the measure measurement thing that we did in terms of you know how would you measurement which is ifrs 13 which is fair value recognition that is something that will be will be covering today in terms of getting on to the details as to what this is all about so should we jump in yes sir ifrs 13 the fair value measurement now this is one of the recent recent ifrss that got introduced primarily to take care of the definition of fair value many of the ifrss as you go forward you would realize talks about fair value and talks about usage of the fair value at various instances however they did not really computed how the fair value is to be is to be really calculated or defined that is the reason the regulator really thought of that there is a need to bring on one more ifrs to that really talks on the fair value measurement and that is what ifrs 13 is all about ifrs 13 talks on the fair value measurement but but it does not apply to the share based payment transaction which is ifrs 2 and leases which is ifrs 16 why because these standards have their own ways of dealing with the fair value transactions we will touch upon that when we will go in there and we'll talk on the ifrs 2 and the ifrs 16 for now have it in your head very clear ifrs 13 doesn't applies to the ifrs 2 which is the share based transactions and ifrs 16 which is leases please please ensure that you remember that all right moving on to the fair value what is fair value fair value is defined as the price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer the liability in orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date i want to circle back few things number 1 measurement date we'll read it again fair value is defined as price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer the liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date i really want to circle back few things primarily because these are the things that you should not 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 forget is that clear yes now what is this market participants we have already spoken are the knowledgeable third parties when pricing an asset or liability they would take into account what condition location and restriction to use it has to be the relevant people 
who has the right knowledge, who can decide based on the condition, location and restriction to use as to what the price should be. Is that clear? Absolutely. It should be assumed that the market participants are not forced into transaction. They are not suffering from the cash flow shortages. See, if you are really deciding the value, really deciding the price, price has to be decided in an orderly transaction wherein there is no pressure on anyone in terms of deciding the price or paying the price or receiving the price. Whenever there is a pressure, there is all the more a reason that you may not have the rightful price over there. Then it will be either a suppressed price or an overly charged price which may not truly represent the fair value. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on. IFRS 13 notes that there are various approaches to determine the fair value of asset or liability. Number one, market approach. Valuation based on recent sales price. You remember we did that as an example? Share price. Delta Corp. Which is nothing but the valuation that was being based on recent prices of the shares. Absolutely clear, sir. Cost approaches, valuation based on replacement cost. Remember the equipment of Pankaj Singra, wherein we have the video equipments and we did not have any market price because they were not being sold elsewhere. And what we took was the replacement price. Yes, sir. Pretty clear. Then comes the income approaches, which is nothing but the valuation based on the financial forecast, which I can say the present value of the future forecast. We also did that when we were doing the value in use. Is that clear? Yes, I'm, I'm just trying to make you remember that again and again so that it really sticks onto your head and you do not forget that. All right, moving on. Whatever approach is taken, the aim is always the same to estimate the price that would be transferred in the transaction with the market participant. Always remember that. Very basic, my friend. Fair value. Fair value IFRS 13 is very simple, very clear. No rocket science. All right, moving on. The price. What is the price? Fair value is market-based measurement. Always market-based measurement. Not one that entity, not one that is entity specific. As such, when determining the price at which an asset would be sold or the price that will be paid to transfer a liability, observable data from the active market should be used wheresoever possible. You should always find out what is the price. If I'm trying to sell Delta Corp, I'll find what is the price of Delta Corp in the active market, which is where it is being traded. Absolutely. An active market is a market where transaction for the assets or liability occur frequently, which is in this case is stock market. We all know that. Got it. IFRS 13 classifies inputs of valuation techniques into three levels. Now, what if my friend, what if we do not have an active market of that product? What if, if Delta Corp is not being sold in the stock market for whatever reason? The classical example, I have, um, I have the share of, let's say, uh, a company which has gone bankrupt for whatever reason and now the shares are not, while they are being listed but they are not being traded for whatever reason. I do not have an active market for that share. Now how should I value that share? For at what value? So laws or the regulator gives us three different scenarios. Number one, level one inputs are quoted prices of the identical asset in the, in the active market. So if you don't have price of that particular asset available in the active market, find out an identical asset identical asset means asset which are somewhat likely to you know to you know comparable to what you really have for which you're valuing find out the price of that identical asset in the active market all right then comes the level two where inputs are observable prices now i don't have price for my uh, my stock being available in the in the active market i do not have price of identical product being available in the in the active market so neither my price is available nor the level one which is the price of an identical product is being available in the market then i should fall back on the level two which is inputs are level two inputs are observable prices that are not level one inputs this may include what quoted price of similar asset in the active market now they're not identical now they're similar identical means very very much same right 
same in the you know same business same structure same level of output same uh, uh, financials and so on and so forth so they are very identical but in this case they are saying that if you don't have identical take the similar ones quoted price of the similar ones in the active market then quoted price of identical asset in the less active market so you may not have the same active market being available but do you have identical asset available in the less less active market if yes take that if not then observable input that are not prices such as interest rates if it is like that then take that too it is the hierarchy that is to be followed my friend take the price of that product in the active market if not available take the product uh, price of the identical product in the market active market if available if not go on to the observable prices which is the level 2 take on for the similar asset in the active market if not available take on the identical asset in the inactive or less active market or then coming on to the third one which is take if it is if the input that are not that are not prices then you know you can you can de definitely think about the interest rates that are being available and then the level 3 is the inputs where in level 3 is are the inputs are not are un unobservable inputs which is like i i would consider this to be a to to be a very smart uh, uh, management guess kind of a thing wherein i can't get a price uh, of the commodity or of the asset i can't get the price of the identical asset i can't get the price of a similar asset now what should i do i should make a guess i should make an estimate that's what this is all about this could include cash or profit forecast using an entity's own data so you will calculate the present value of the cash forecast and so on and so forth in order to calculate the fair value if i have to repeat this you have to think about the three three broad pillars the first price is the price of the same commodity what you really want to really value find out the price in the active market if you're not able to do that go for the identical product can you get that in the active market good enough if you're not able to do that go for the similar product if you're not able to do that go for the identical product in the less active market if you're not able to do that then just do a calculation basis your own estimation which is the level three is that clear yes sir significant adjustment to level two input would lead to being categorized as level 3 input of course if you are making good amount of adjustment to the level 2 input it effectively means level 3 which is like you are only making an estimates then it is not a not a re relevant price or the or the right price priority is given to level 1 input the lowest priority is given to level 3 input it goes without saying as i said you have to follow the hierarchy the best piece is to follow and get the price of that product in the active market and so on and so forth as we just mentioned coming on to markets my friend the, the price received when the asset is sold or paid when a liability is transferred may differ depending on specific market where the transaction occurs of course market wise also it can be a difference now what is that you have two kinds of market number one is the principal market ifrs 13 says that fair value should be measured by reference to the principal market you have to have the principal principal market where the the, the commodity is, is traded the principal market is the market with the greatest activity of the assets and liability being measured okay entity must be able to access the principal market at the measurement date at the measurement date you should be able to really have the value of that particular asset or liability this means that the principal market for the same asset can differ between the entities got it if you are not able to find the principal market you have to find the most advantageous market of that commodity or that asset or liability if there is no principal market fair value is measured by reference to the price in the most advantageous market the most advantageous market is the one that maximizes the net amount received from selling an asset or minimizes the amount paid to transfer or liability so effectively you whenever you don't have the have the uh, you know the primary market for it always think about always think about the situation wherein you have a market which just give you 
the maximize maximize net amount that you receive always always look for that is that clear yes sir now i just want to touch upon on the transaction cost transaction cost is the legal or the broker fees that you may have to pay if you have to sell will play a role in deciding the market is most advantageous so it, if these are the costs that really plays a big role in deciding which market is more advantageous however fair value is not adjusted for transaction cost because they are characterized or because they are characteristics of the market rather than the asset please please underline that fair value is not adjusted for transaction cost because they are characteristics of the market rather than the asset this is super important for you to know that you would not be adjusting you would not be adjusting the transaction cost in the fair value is that clear if i really have to think about the fair value fair value is nothing but the price that i would get in the active market in the orderly conditions is that clear yes we will be touching upon on this in various ifrss when we will deal with various scenarios and see through in terms of how to calculate fair value in that kind of a scenario with the help of various examples too so do not get really worried on it in terms of you know how should you be handling that in the practical environment we will be doing enough examples we will be doing enough questions in our video question marathon also so do not be worried about it we will gonna be killing it is that clear yes sir now let's just quickly revise in terms of you know what we have done and then we'll jump on on to doing the practice questions so should we start off yes sir let's quickly see in terms of you know where we started our day and where we started this 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 journey of the conceptual framework and then we'll just quickly come on and do the questions all righty let's go up let's go up it was a long class in terms of you know covering what we really had to but we have been able to get everything what we needed all right we'll start it off with the conceptual framework we touched upon you know as to what the conceptual framework is which is what they are really be thinking about and of course we we we, we really touched upon the advantages of the conceptual framework in terms of you know what the conceptual framework really bring on in terms of adding value to the financial reporting very generic and then we touched upon the disadvantages after that we touched upon the purpose of the of the of the conceptual framework you remember we touched upon that they basically assist the board they assist the preparers of the financial statement and they also assist what they assist all the parties who are intending to understand the financial statement then we did the objective of the financial reporting which is nothing but to help the current and the future who investors creditors lenders and who not in terms of you know really getting the right information that they really need and of course they what they really need is the 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 the, uh, the statement of financial positions the income and expenditure account and of course you know how the cash flows of the organization is being taken care of then we touched upon what we touched upon the qualitative characteristics now i would not be repeating that you would do that the qualitative characteristics are nothing but the fruit for your cv yes sir where in c stands for sir comparability sir v stands for verifiability sir f stands for faithful representation sir r sir r stands for relevance sir so now it is getting into our blood sir we know that sir ui ui stands for understandable information sir pretty clear sir t t stands for timeliness sir pretty clear sir no issue sir pretty clear all right moving on my friend then we touched upon the financial statements and again very generic we did assets liabilities equities income expenses we touched upon the elements of the financial statements again the same thing we touched upon and understood in detail as to assets liability equity income and expenses then we touched upon the recognition and de recognition as to when you will recognize which is nothing but when it is relevant when it really calls out for the faithful representation and when the cost really do not overweigh the benefit 
All right. Then we did the de recognition, which is vice versa. When you would de recognize an asset, then we did the measurement in terms of you know how would you measure it, which is the historical cost. Remember, my dad purchasing the building, absolutely clear, sir. Then the fair value, we did the IFRS 13, sir, pretty clear, sir. Delta values, Delta COP, sir, five dollar share, sir, pretty clear. Then we did the value in use, which is nothing but the present value of future cash flows. So we did that five thousand dollars. Remember, remember this example, five thousand dollars. $5,000 at the annuity factor for 8% and that really gives us the value in use and then what we did we did the current cost which is the replacement cost of the equipment of Pankaj Dingra sir pretty clear sir no issues selecting the measurement base was again something very generic you will only select the measurement base that really gives the rightful information effective presentation and disclosure pretty pretty much clear sir classification was also very generic aggregation was also very generic you will only do aggregation when it was really required over aggregation is something that we should certainly certainly avoid then we did the criticism of the financial reporting we briefly touched upon how and what uh, the, the folks have been saying in terms of you know criticizing the financial report which we may not agree in totality but that is what it is then we touched upon the regulatory framework in the regulatory framework we touched upon various various accounting bodies we have IASB we have the IFRS advisory council and we have the international financial reporting standard interpretation committee and over and above that we have the IFRS foundation who IASB reports on to in terms of you know what they really do then we have understood their responsibility element in terms of what they really are responsible for and we have moved on in terms of criticizing the IASB in terms of you know what all are the issues that are there and of course the advantages disadvantages we also did touch upon on the principle and the rule based approach my friend which is very 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 important from the standpoint of understanding that IFRS is on the whole or the conceptual framework on the whole is based on the principle based approach now one thing that I really want to talk on over here is that the overall conceptual framework or the IFRS is you know while they are based on the principle based approach one other thing that you should never forget is that they are really really being made on the going concern principle which is like that you know organization will exist over a period of time so one underlying principle that is there in the conceptual framework is the going concern which we should never forget and again again this is not something new to you but you should never forget that all right moving on my friend we did the advantages of the principle based approach and disadvantages and then we touched upon the fair value measurement which was pretty clear sir not relevant for the IFRS 2 and IFRS 16 and then we touched upon in terms of you know kind of approaches is to have is to be followed which is something we already covered sir market approach cost approach income approach the delta corp share sir the cost approach of course you know the replacement cost that you mentioned and of course the income approach which is like the present value of the future cash flows being discounted at the cost of capital got it sir then comes the price as to how you will file the find the price which is something very clear sir you should always find the price of that product in the active market if we won't get it then we will go for the identical product in the active market if we don't get that then we'll go for the similar product in the active market if we don't have that then we'll go for the identical asset in the not so active market and if that is also not available sir then what we will do is that we will try to make an estimate which is the level 3 input for us estimate basis the cash flows and of course discounting that whatever basis whatever information is available going on to the market market we had the principal market which is like where the 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 transactions of that asset or liability is really happening too often if not then we'll go for the most advantageous market the one that maximizes the net amount received from selling an asset do not do not forget that transaction cost we have done in terms of you know what that is and then we touched upon that you know how and what we should be doing with this transaction cost fair value from the fair value standpoint these transaction costs are not existed pretty clear sir no issue sir this is what i really wanted to cover in this session and now we will move on to the questions should we jump in yes sir let's move on to the example but before we really jump in over there and, and start doing that one thing that i really want to talk on and especially in relation to the long long questions that you would see in the exam what is imperative my friend is that whenever we are dealing with any kind of a question in your exam 
the first and the foremost thing that you really need to do is read the requirement first. I really want to have this foundational basic set in your mind that one thing that you would certainly follow in your exam is that you would read the requirement first before really jumping on and reading such a large question or a big question that you may get to see in the exam. It is very important my friend because reading the requirement of the question at the first instance really helps you catch hold of the relevant information in the question which really saves hell lot of your time and I can tell you with various examples that I've seen and with the experiences that I've had and the feedback that I have from various students this technique really helps and that's what we would follow in terms of you know dealing with any of these questions in terms of you know the way it is coming across like this right now so let's read the requirement first and then we'll read the question as to what it has to say all right i'll just go down and start from the issue as to what the issue is and what the requirement is all right issue is before i can agree before i can agree okay someone is agreeing with the move to move to ifrs okay there is a discussion in terms of moving to ifrs i can i can make out that i need to understand okay he needs to understand what how the standard setting process works okay they need to understand how the standard setting process works someone told me that there are four different bodies involved okay please give me brief description of each one of these highlighting their role in the standard setting process what is required is prepare a response for the issue raised by the director so what i'm read i'm making out after reading this is that there is a uh, uh, an issue going on in, with the director wherein he needs to understand as to what all are the four bodies that are involved in the IFRS setting because they are thinking of moving to the IFRS standard and he needs to understand the process. So effectively I need to draft a response for that director saying that who all are the four bodies and what all are their responsibilities. Now I have known and understood the issue from here. I know what the director is thinking about. I know what I really need to write, who, what all four bodies I need to cover because I have done the conceptual framework, sir. We are Fintrammer, sir. We are very much aware of it. We can reasonably and fairly handle that. Absolutely, my friend. But you still have to read the question if question has to say. So I'm not saying that only read the requirement and start answering. Read the requirement. Many of the times requirement will certainly help you in terms of, you know, getting the full hang of the question as to what the need is and then read the requirement as to you know what the the content of the question has to say and then start writing but in this question the way i see it is that i know what i really need to write because i have to write about the bodies and i i will write it i know about the body so i don't know if the question itself will change my my answer but i will read that having said that my friend what is important over here is that you should realize that how the examiner is testing you with the theory gone are the days wherein he'll give you some some bit of he'll ask you you know what this organization is all about or he'll give you the fill in the blanks or he'll give you the mcq gone are the days he is giving you a full-fledged question and then asking your opinion that is the essence of this exam my friend that is what you would be expected in the examination room and that is what we will be practicing a lot over here as well as in a video question marathon wherein we will be doing a plethora in, of, of questions in terms of you know what and how you should be handling that. Let's read the question and then we'll see as to what the answer is all about. All right, reading example number one which is you are the financial controller of Omega. Okay, Omega has subsidiaries located in different countries. Okay, Omega has the strategy of growth by acquisition and regularly evaluates potential acquisition target from different countries and financial reporting regimes. Okay. Omega regularly seeks to raise capital on number of different markets to fund new acquisitions. Alrighty. All subsidiaries currently prepare financial statements using applicable local accounting standards. Got it. The consolidated financial statements have been prepared using local accounting standards that apply in Omega's jurisdiction up to and including the year ended 31st September, 30th September 2001. The local regulations allow financial statement to be prepared using local accounting standards or IFRS standards. Directors are giving serious consideration to using IFRS standards from the year ending 30th September 2002 onwards. One of the directors, okay. 
is unsure of the wisdom of this proposal and has identified an issue about which he is uncertain. Issue is something we have already read and requirement is something which is very much clear. We need to tell them as to what all are the four accounting bodies which are helping in terms of you know setting this standard and of course we know that we will write it. Important is that we have read the requirement and then we have read the question. Many of the times you will find two or three requirements being given. So read those two or three requirements. Some of it may not be dependent on the question like in this case it is my answer would not be dependent on what I just read. My answer is something very generic about these four bodies in terms of what these four bodies will do. But requirement number two if it was here can be something that is relatable to what the, you know, what the overall content of the question is all about. In that case you have to circle back on various other pointers. But the principle that we will follow is that we will read the requirement of the question first and then the content. Is that clear? Yes sir. Should we go and now write as to what the answer should be? Absolutely, sir. Alrighty, going in. Solution. Standard setting is a comprehensive process which includes four bodies helping to get to the right standard, providing below the role and responsibility of each of them. Absolutely, absolutely clear, sir. No problem. Number one is IFRS Foundation. We all know that IFRS Foundation is the supreme. Foundation is responsible for standard setting process as a whole and seeks to ensure that standard setting bodies have appropriate work plans are and are financed accordingly. This is the basic. They know it. We know that. Absolutely clear. Moving on. IASB. IASB is the second body. IASB is the IFRS Foundation independent standard setting body. We know that which develops and publishes IFRS standards. In doing this, it allows a transparent due process, including the publication of consultation documents such as exposure drafts and decision discussion papers. We all know that, my friend. We all have gone through that. All of this in our blood. It is how you write it is something that you need to learn. How you are going to give back to the examiner is something that you need to learn. And that is what we are observing. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on. IFRS Advisory Council, we know that they are there and what they do, they advise ISB on the range of issues such as the appropriateness of its work plan. Remember the prioritization? Yes, it also advises on the single project with an emphasis on the practical and implementation issues, any kind of issues that you may foresee, it really helps. You can have a different language, my friend. What is important is that you understand as to what the Advisory Council does and you are able to give back the examiner in the exact way he wants. All right, coming on to the IFRS Interpretation Committee. The IFRS Interpretation Committee reviews accounting issues that have arisen or could arise in the context of IFRS standard and provide authoritative guidance over them. These are the four bodies who are involved in the IFRS standard in terms of making a standard and this is what they do. This is what the director wanted. This is what we have given them back. Many of the times, my friend, as I've been saying again and again, these theoretical topics we think may not be important from the examination standpoint, but examiner, as I said, has a very different way of asking it. And that is something we have covered categorically in detail in our sessions. And that is what we're doing. We would be doing in detail in our video question marathon also, wherein, as I said, we will be practicing many questions to give you the context as to how examiner can test you. Is that clear? Yes, sir. That is what I wanted to cover in this session, my friend. I'll see you again in the next session. Till then, this is Pankaj Jingra signing off.